All right, so um, Eric had requested um, stuff from rate laws and then unit nine. So I went on and I found um, some examples of these. Um, so I don't know if you've had time to we click this over or not. Um, I did include um, in an email to the people who are taking the AP exam the answer key for this. So if we don't get through everything, you can go on and, and look at that. Um, <clears throat> so this one, this is a first order reaction. And they want you to explain how the data table is consistent with the first order reaction. Okay. Well, remember that rate law. Um, is independent of the pressure and um, at when it's at the, the constant temperature. It's also independent of the concentrations when it's at the constant temperature. Okay, so the rate is. Um, and then if you look here where they doubled the temperature, or they, I'm sorry, not doubled, but they increased the temperature, that rate went down. So you can see that, <clears throat> okay? The volume also changed here, and the, uh, but the temperature did as well. Um, yeah? So did it, did it technically sense its half-life and it like speed up the reaction and increase the temperature? It, it increased, yeah, the temperature, the temperature increase increased the reaction rate. But changing the volume didn't because here we went from two to four. The temperature stayed the same. The rate stayed the same. <clears throat> so what do you say for an explanation? Um, the the half-life is independent of the reactant's concentration and pressure at a constant temperature. All right, um, calculate the rate constant here. Um, include appropriate. Mr. Hertz, please call 5210. Mr. Hertz, please call 5210. Appropriate um, units. Remember, you've got your sheet here, so don't try to go back in your brain and, and remember things. You know, when they're talking about rate, go onto your sheet here with kinetics, and you'll see a section on there that says half life. There's a formula that uses half life. So if you go and grab that formula, that formula is T one half equals 0.693 over K. And then you can just rearrange this. So K would equal 0.693 over the half life here. And they said for the reaction at 350. So we want to grab this hundred here and put that underneath. And so then if you um, do your and this, you would be able to use a calculator for this. So this would be 0 0.00693. And then remember your units are gonna be S minus one. Because <clears throat> this would have been seconds here. That makes sense? So, okay, so half-life is inverse second. And uh, uh, so the one thing I was confused about with the um, with the units was the like the liters. Like I know the the m is the one minus you know the overall reaction and then inverse time for like a regular rate law. But like what is the liters? Like what, what do you do with the liters? For in this particular well, problem? Not in this not in this particular one, but in general. Like what do you do with the liters? I don't think there is liters. I think it's molarity. That you're thinking of. Oh, okay. Well, oh, it's because when I was watching the videos, the the guy was, kept putting mole liters seconds. Well, remember, molarity is moles over liters. So you can just leave it as molarity. Yeah, yeah, you can leave it as big M. Yeah. 
All right. Um, is the initial rate of reaction in trial one greater than, less than, or equal to the initial rate in trial two? So initial rate here, when we're looking at this, um, your concentration in one is less I'm sorry, yeah, is less than the concentration here because you can see here if the pressure is 600, that stuff's going to be crammed together tighter than it would be here, right? So your concentration is going to be less in trial one than it would be in trial two. So the initial rate, trial one is going to go slower than trial two because the concentration is less in trial one than it is in trial two. So it doesn't matter on the K value then? Mm -mm. No. If you're talking about Kelvin temperature K value is the same and your rate would be the same here as well. That's, that's what this K about. value would be the same as well. Because I thought the, the rate constant was the same. So it, it is. But this is initial rate. Okay, so just starting right out of the gate, boom, okay? You've got more concentration here, so therefore it's going to be less than. Um, <clears throat> the half-life of the reaction in trial four is less than the half-life in trial one. Explain in terms of activation energy. Well, here your temperature is higher. So if your temperature is higher, there's going to be more molecules. If you think about the Boltzmann, you know, distribution, you're going to have more molecules in trial two than you would in, or I'm sorry, in trial four than you would in trial one. Trial one is going to be, you know, more like this because you're going to have more molecules over on this side than you would over here. Does that make sense? So more of your molecules are going to have attained the activation energy required for the reaction when they're at 365 versus 350. All right. <clears throat> the next one, we have blue food coloring that's getting added um, with bleach. And that bleach then is going to turn colorless. And this is one of those spec labs where we had those little vials, the cuvettes that we put in, and we were check seeing the absorbance that was going through there. All right. Based on the graphs here, what is the order of the reaction for this guy? First order, correct. And you know that because, and they didn't ask you. Okay, so here's another thing. They did not ask you to justify that on this question. Don't justify it. Okay. If they ask you to give them the order, give them the order. It's first order. Boom. Walk away. Don't keep going. Because if you keep going and your explanation is wrong, they will mark the whole thing wrong. Plus, you're wasting time. And time is of the essence. So only answer the question that they put in front of you, and that's it. Don't go any further than that. All right. Reaction is known to be first order with respect to the bleach. In the second experiment, the student prepares food coloring and bleach with concentrations that differ from those in the first experiment. When the solutions are combined, they observe that the rea reaction mixture reaches an absorbance nearly zero too rapidly. So it's going from this blue color to colorless, almost like boom. Just too fast, okay? So what would be a possible modification to the experiment? Would you want to increase the temperature? No, typically increasing the temperature will make the reaction go faster. Would you want to, um, so increasing the temperature is out. Increasing the concentration of the food coloring or of the bleach. So one of these is going to work, one of these isn't. Which one's going to work? The food coloring, right. Because the bleach is going to make it go colorless even faster. Adding the bleach made it go colorless. 
And if we add more bleach in, it's going to go colorless even faster than that. Okay. So this is the one that you want. <clears throat> so by adding the food coloring, you're increasing the concentration of the food coloring, thus allowing the um, reaction to be extended out and remain colorless longer. Uh, in another experiment, the student wishes to study the oxidation of food, red food coloring with bleach. How would they modify the original experiment? What did you have to do? What would you have to do to change this experiment around? Other than just changing, so you're changing the food coloring, so we're already doing that. But what would you have to do with your instrumentation to make this work? Exactly. Yep. Okay. So that wavelength is set up for blue light right now. Okay, or actually the opposite of blue light. Um, and you would need to change that to red. Okay. All right, decomposition reaction of hydrogen peroxide to form water is represented with this guy. Proposed mechanism for the reaction involves free radicals and is represented by these equations. Write the rate law consistent with this proposal. So rate equals what? K. Okay, don't forget your K in there. All right, um, the rate of decomposition was studied and the data was um, noted on the graph below. And of course, it didn't bother to put the graph in here. So I emailed that to you, if you were checking your email at all today. Um, class today. Graph was missing. Here we go. So here's the graph. And they are asking you to look through here and you're figuring out the change between certain times. The time is 1.5 molar and 0.75 molar. So you apply in 1.5 molar on here and figure out your time for that. So that time ended up being 0.2, it looks like. And then find 0.75 molar, which is about here. Go down, find the time for that. And that ended up being 0.7. So the difference in that time would be half an hour. And then they made you do that again, um, 0.8 to 0.4. But if you notice, this is a half-life question. So the answer is going to be the same. Because the half-life remains the same. So you really don't need to redo that calculation if you're kind of savvy about this whole thing. Okay. There's another one that we'll have that I dropped the voltage on when it printed, it didn't keep the voltage. So I've got that in this email as well. We'll come back to that in a little bit. All right. Um, so we answered that one. Experimental data is consistent with a proposed mechanism. An electrochemical cell decomp here is constructed. They gave us this data here. Um, explain. So the experimental data is consistent with the proposed mechanism. So remember what the proposed mechanism was was K and then your H2O2 concentration, that was your rate, equals this. And they're asking you about how this graph supports this information. What order of reaction is this? First order, this is a half-life showing the distribution at half-life. That's how that supports that. This is a first order reaction and it shows the half-life data here. Okay. Calculate the value of the standard cell potential. So which one is my cation or which one is my cathode and which one is my anode? First reaction. First reaction is cathode. This is my anode. How can you tell? Yep, this is more positive. So we're going to subtract cathode minus anode. 
So cathode minus anode, that ends up being point 1.03. Volts. It's a minus a negative, so that's why we end up adding it together. Good? All right, indicate whether delta G for the decomp is zero, less than zero, or equal to zero. So greater than, less than, or equal to zero. What's it going to be? What does a positive delta G indicate? Is a positive delta G thermodynamically favorable? No. Is this thermodynamically favorable? Yes. Yes. So your delta G has to be what? Less than zero. So the justification is, is that the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, therefore delta G needs to be less than zero. They do not want essays either, you guys. Like, state the thing and move on. <clears throat> They're going to leave room in between here, too, for you to answer. I just didn't have time to format this nice and pretty for you guys this morning. When I got in... I got his email at like seven o'clock this morning and I threw this together between now and then. So I didn't have a lot of time to sit there and, and yeah, format like, and like that eleven o'clock in that Yeah. But I went to bed earlier than that. So yeah. so this isn't pretty, it's not formatted nice, but um, but it works. All right, draw a circle around the quantities below that has a different value for the catalyzed reaction than for the uncatalyzed reaction. So first of all, what does a catalyzed reaction do? What is it's lower than the activation energy. So if this was our reaction, it might lower it to look something like this. Okay? But our delta H is still going to be the same, isn't it? Your your difference between here and here is still going to be the same whether it's catalyzed or not. So that guy's out. Your uh, reaction uh, equilibrium quotient here is still going to be the same because your products, your, you're still going to form the same stuff. You just don't need as much energy for it. And your delta G is still going to be the same as well. So the only thing that that leaves is your activation energy. The quantity. Um, that's your reaction quotient. So that's your um, products over your reactants. So for this guy, that would be your H2O, and we would need to square that over O2, over H2O2 squared. Okay? Those concentrations aren't going to change. Um, equilibrium, um, so it's these... It would be Kc would be, it's just your equilibrium quotient. So you got all these equilibrium things over here. Uh, for any quantity that you circled indicate its value is greater than, less than, uh, or less than for, so this would actually be less than the catalyzed reaction. So that um, catalyzed, uncatalyzed, this would be greater than for your EA. Like, what, what would you do to explain that? Let's just be like, explain because why? Like because your it? your activation energy, a catalyst lowers your activation energy. That's that that's its purpose. Enough. Yeah, that's its purpose. So essentially, you're just giving kind of a explanation of of what a catalyst does. So I was confused. I was like, I was yeah. Well, remember, they are going to throw a few bones at you. You know, they're going to give you some some easy ones. They're going to lob a few things at you that are easy because they need to be able to distinguish between ones and twos. 
Okay. So by kind of throwing you a couple bones here and there, don't think that every question is going to be impossible. The other thing is, is that, you know, when you're doing these things and you've got information that's feeding from one problem into another, if you don't know how to calculate, let's see that this was your Delta E and then they wanted you to take this and dump it into Faraday's constant and, and, you know, calculate number of electrons. If you didn't remember how to do this guy, throw a number down, you know, 1.5 volts. I right, throw that number down and then feed that into the next thing because they, they do the right but wrong. That's where I got that from. Okay. So if you don't know how to do this guy and you're stuck here, but you know how to do this step, this step, this step, and, but you need this data, throw a number down. You'll get a point off for this, but if you get these right, you're still going to get those points. Does that make sense? Just make up a number and run with it. All right. You've got 87.5% of the sample that's decayed. They want to know it's half-life. So if you've got 87.5 that's gone, how much do you have that's remaining? 12.5. So 12.5 is here. You started out with 100%, didn't you? Divide this sucker down until you get to 12.5. How many times did you divide this? Three. So 24 divided by 3 equals... This you need to be able to do in your head. This is a multiple choice. Here's your answer. Does that make sense how I did that? Yes. All right. This is a first order reaction. So if it's first order, you automatically think half-life. Okay. So half-life is given. They want you to calculate the half-life. It's dropped to one eighth its original value. So if we started at a whole, we go to a half, we go to a quarter, we go to an eighth. How many times did I divide that? Three, so it took 124 seconds for the whole thing to happen. How long did it take to go from here to here? Yep, divide that by three. So 12 divided by 3 is 3 will go into 12 how many times? Four. 4. Don't even need to go any further. There's your answer. So, okay, so I'm just confused about this. So, I, so why is first order, like, always half-life? The first order reactions, the way that they decay, they follow this half-life. Half of it remains, and then another half, and then another half. That's just, there's just an association between those. And we talked about that back then, but we really just don't have time to go through that now. Just know that there's this connection, okay? If you wanna get into it in more detail, we'll go back and talk about that stuff after the exam. But right now, I'm just trying to get through as much stuff as I can. All right, so we've got this reaction mechanism for the ozone destruction, overall reaction. Um, in the overall reaction, NO is best described as. So what is NO doing here? NO is doing what? Catalyzing. It's listed here and here. Yes, it is a catalyst. Good. Okay. Um, if we, we've got the, we, we've still got this guy going here. Okay, proposed mechanism is here. Which of the following is evidence that the mechanism is occurring? Okay, and they're focusing on chlorine here. I can see that. So I want to look at the chlorine. I've got chlorine here and I've got chlorine here. What is that chlorine? What, because I've got it here and here. What is the name of that? That is a catalyst. What does a catalyst do? lowers the activation energy, okay? So is that gonna have any effect on this equilibrium constant at all? No, catalysts don't have any effect on equilibrium constant. So we can get rid of both of those. Now, is that catalyst going to increase the rate of the reaction or is it gonna decrease it? What is the purpose of the catalyst? 
There's your answer. You can mark on your test books. Mark them up. You paid $100 for those things. Mark them up. Okay? It makes life easier if you can see what's going on, I think, personally. All right. Electron configuration. You guys remember those? Okay. They want a complete one. That means that you cannot go back to the previous noble gas. And they even started it here for you. They were nice about that, saying, hey, we want an electron configuration. So for zinc 2 plus, though, this is zinc 2 plus. If it's 2 plus, what does that mean has happened? Mm. It's lost two electrons. Where would those two electrons have been lost from? The 4S subshell, correct. So when you go to write this down, make sure that you don't include that 4S subshell. Okay, take a second to write that guy down. Done? Nope. Oh, you did it. I almost did it. It's force of habit. Piece of crap. Yes. Oh, that's the other thing. Use a pencil tomorrow and bring in a good eraser. Okay? Um, a lot of the AP exams, they, they require you to use pen, but... AP Chem, they let you use pencil, but these are all going to be scanned in this year because they're they're sending them to like people's homes to do like they're electronically scanning them this year as opposed to everybody goes to Salt Lake City and sits in a big room. So make sure that you're writing dark enough that it'll be picked up by a copy machine if you use a pencil. Okay. Um. So for us, so this is going to be three D ten. All right, because those two electrons would have been lost from this guy. Good? Clear? All right, which species, Zn or Zn2+, plus, has the greatest ionization energy? And justify your answer. Yep. Okay. Now they're not going to give you a point for identifying this guy. They're going to give you the point for this. Okay. You got to do that first, but they're not going to give you anything for it. This is where your points are coming from is your justification. So how do you justify that? Well, your zinc for both of them, they're going to have 30 protons, right? But your Zn2 plus is going to have 28 electrons okay so the the zn2 plus is going to have a greater effective nuclear charge versus the zn okay it's got more protons than it has electrons so the effective nuclear charge is going to be greater for that guy it also takes more energy to pull an electron away from this guy than it would be to pull it away from this guy because of that imbalance. Remember your justification. They're not going to give you any points without that justification. All right, we've got a species here. We need to identify which one is being oxidized in the reaction. They gave us the reaction up here. If you get down here and you're like, I don't know, go back up to the top and see if you've missed this guy. Because I missed him initially and I'm like, Huh, I can't tell from the picture. And then I realized that I had this guy up here that I needed to go to. Okay. So from this, you should be able to easily tell which one of these is being oxidized. So is it, it's the, the vowels go together, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And oxidized? Yep. Um, and remember oxidized, your um, oxidation is lost, oil, rig. And then remember your fat cat. Okay, so your cathode is going to get bigger. 
and your cathode is going to go with your rig. Oil goes with your anode. So here my aluminum is losing electrons. So the aluminum is the anode. So this is my anode over here. This is going to be my cathode. They asked us, they didn't ask us what that was though. They asked us which one was being oxidized. So oxidation is lost. That is going to be my aluminum. So make sure that you're not telling them like, oh, this aluminum is the anode. Aluminum is oxidized because they asked us about oxidation. So be careful with that too, okay? All right. We have our diagram that's including the salt bridge. It's filled with this saturated. What happens if that's, um, describe what happens in the salt bridge as the cell operates, okay? So my aluminum, as this aluminum, since this is the anode, it is forming these Al aluminum three plus ions, okay? So I need, it's forming more positives. So the nitrogen is going to become, or the nitrate is going to be coming in the, from the salt bridge this direction. Here, the positive charge is being lost. It's going onto the zinc and it's getting added as with those electrons that are coming in, okay? And we're forming zinc. So I'm losing positive charges here. So here, the potassium ions are going to be coming in this direction. That make sense? So uh, the diagram shows the salt bridge. Describe what's happening in the salt bridge. So I would say that the nitrate is entering the aluminum um, nitrate cell. That's the word I'm looking for, cell, to balance out the positive charges that are building up in that cell. And here the potassium is coming into the zinc nitrate cell to balance out the positive charges that are leaving that cell. Indicate the value of the standard free energy change for the cell, no, determine the standard E, I'm sorry. So we need to determine this. This is the other email that I sent you, okay? And in that email, I told you that zinc, the reduction potential for zinc is um, going to be a uh, negative 0.76 and the reduction potential for aluminum is going to be a negative 1.66. Okay, so this is my anode, this is my cathode. So anode minus my cathode will give me my E value and when I minus those I get a 0.9 volt difference. All right, indicate the value of the standard uh, free energy delta G for the cell reaction if it's negative, positive, or zero. You should be able to answer this based on our first question we talked about. It's the same question. Is this gonna run on its own based on this 0.9 value here? Is this reaction gonna run? Does it have to be positive to be turned out? Yeah, the, yeah, a positive E will be thermodynamically favorable. So a positive E means a what kind of G? A negative G. Yep. So because your your E value is thermo, indicates that you're going to be thermodynamically favorable, your delta G has to be negative. All right. If the concentration is lowered in here, so we've got less aluminum Al3 plus in here. So we've got fewer of these. Fewer of these are in here. Is this cell going to increase the voltage, decrease, or remain the same? This is a Le Chatelier question. So we've reduced the amount of Al3+. plus. What's going to happen to be able to, to deal with that? It's going to make more. So more of this aluminum is going to be coming in this direction. If more aluminum comes in this direction, what does that mean is going through here? Electrons. So we're getting more and more and more electrons. What's that going to do to my voltage? Yeah, it's going to increase it.
it seems counterintuitive because you've you've reduced the concentration here so you're like well of course it's going to no it does not not in this case so you've got to think about what effect that would have on these electrons moving through here that makes sense eric yeah. the, okay all right uh, multiple choice question based on the diagram We've got NO2 going to N2O4 over here. Based on the diagram, which best predicts the sign of the entropy or the change here? Has this become more organized on this side or is it more organized over here? So the right side is more organized. What does that indicate about my entropy then? Which entropy is higher here? This or this one? Yes, this is a higher entropy. This is a lower entropy. So my entropy is what? Negative or positive? My entropy has gone down from here to here. Is it negative or positive? Negative. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of both of these answers. And now I'm going to try to figure these two. It's negative because the N2O4 molecules increase as the reaction proceeds, or it's negative because the number of molecules in the gas phase decreased as the reaction proceeded. Hmm? B. B. Yep, good. All right, this is can you handle algebra? Seriously, like straight up. Okay. Oh, is this just like unbroken? Uh, this is your delta S. So you actually have a formula on there for delta S. Um, that is right over here. So it's products minus reactants. See that? Uh, for those of you playing at home, it's right here. On your sheet. Um, so we've got products minus reactants. So this guy is my products. This guy is my reactants. Okay. So my products are SO3, and I've got two of them. So I got to double that amount. So double the amount of this. So 257 minus. Now I've got to take this guy, which we don't know, so we're going to do 2x plus 205. And that's going to equal a negative 187. 187. Nope. They're not asking you to calculate this. They're asking you to rearrange it. Look at the options here. So you should be able to algebraically rearrange this thing without having to crunch any numbers. And here, it's just sheer algebra from this point on. Okay. So we're trying to get X by itself. I'm just confused because, like, the only positive 187 is C, but it's not half. Oops, shoot. Okay, if I want to get this guy on the other side, it's a minus 187 minus 2 times 257. Right? Everybody with me there? Okay. Now I'm going to go through. Everything's kind of negatives here. So I'm going to go through and make everything positive now. Because if I just multiply both sides by negative 1, then that's going to take care of that negative problem. And, and like he was saying, we need to do something about that. Okay? So that would make this a positive 2x plus 205 minus, or equals, excuse me, 187 plus... 2 times 
Okay. Then if I do 2x equals 187 plus 2 times 257 minus 205. And then I need to divide by 2 to get 2 on this side. That takes care of that 2. And now I'm going to look for something that has this in it. So that's 1 half. So that's a one half there and a one half there. So I'm going to get rid of this guy and this guy because I know I've got to have a one half. And then I've got a positive and positive and a minus. So that makes it C. Fun? Oh, algebra. Have you forgotten your algebra? That was just a sheer can you follow algebra problem. All right, reaction here, what can be inferred about our delta S? Okay, we are going from 1 to 3. So we know that our delta S has done what? Uh, We've gone from 1 mole to 3 moles. So it's increased, so it's going to be positive. So we're going to get rid of this guy, and we're going to get rid of this guy. Now we've got to figure out which is which, okay? It must be positive since the reaction is thermodynamically favorable at 600 degrees K. And they did say that it goes to completion at 600 K. So they're, they've, they've given us that part. So, hmm? This is on K. This is thermodynamically unfavorable. Okay, then we are going to get rid of A. Because it is thermodynamically favorable. How do we know thermodynamically? Because they said that it essentially went to completion. Oh, okay, so I didn't think it goes to completion. Good? Think sense? All right, uh, number 12. Um, we've got our delta S and our delta H here. They've shown us that um, represented here. Which diagram could be could help explain the low yield of the reaction under these conditions and why? Okay, diagram one, it represents a reaction that is not thermodynamically favorable. Well, we don't know that. I mean, it, it could be thermodynamically favorable. It ran. Some of it ran. Diagram one it rea uh, represents a reaction that reaches equilibrium quickly after a small amount of reaction is is consumed. The, we don't know that. Diagram two has a high activation energy. And because of that, the molecules have to overcome and very slow reaction rate even if it's thermodynamically favorable or diagram two because it represents a reaction that is thermodynamically favorable with a delta H that is greater than zero but the products formed are unstable we don't know that we don't know that the products are unstable here but we can see that this does have a much higher activation energy right and that is the diagram that we want to go with All right, synthesis here, um, NH3 is represented by the equation above based on the equilibrium constant and delta H given. Which of the following can best be used to justify the reaction is thermodynamically favorable at, um, at 298 and a constant pressure? Um, delta G here, we've got, um, let's see my notes. This is 13. I'm in the wrong direction. Okay. So this this K value, what what does this indicate, this number? Is this a big K or a little K value? This is really big. And what does a really big K indicate to you? Which is favored, reactants or products? Products. Okay, this is going to be favorable. Okay, 
So because K is so large, okay, um, what's the difference between A and B? Oh, here. So because the K is so large, that's going to make this run. So B is the answer here. I can't believe that went so fast. All right, go through the last couple on your own. Um, the answer key is uploaded. And good luck, you guys. Let me know. Like, email me. Let me know how it goes, okay? And I will see you guys tomorrow. I won't see you till Monday. So.